Welcome to the Journal Club this evening. This is Richard Alders, the oncologist at uh, London Vet Specialist, and I'll be presenting two papers. And um, we'll just start with the first one. Um, this is on recurrence free interval 12 months after local and uh, local treatment of mast cell tumours in dogs using intratumoral injection of tigalinol tigalate, which I'll probably refer to as Delfonta for ease from here on. Delfonta is a small molecule um, for intratumoral injection, which was approved late uh, early last year by the European Medicine Agencies. Um, for uh, the treatment of dermal, non resectable non-metastatic mast cell tumours anywhere on the body and subcutaneous, non resectable non-metastatic mast cell tumours. The latter had to be below the tarsi or below the elbow because um, in, well, the mast cell tumours turn to mush uh, generally after injection and that mush has to basically be able to drain somewhere perfectly to the surface of the body. Um, and if it's above the tarsi or above the elbow, we might develop sinus tracts or sterile abscesses that don't drain to the surface of the body. The treatment is said to be pro-inflammatory and stimulating the immune system, but especially causing vascular collapse, which leads to a type of ischemic um, cell death, also known as oncosis, which is uh, mentioned in the article. As I mentioned, this tends to turn the um, tumour material to mush. Uh, or lysis of the mass with um, preferably an external wound forming. The um, manufacturers say that wounds are good because it shows that the treatment is working and probably going to be successful. And this wound then heals by second intention. So the idea is that um, no uh, wound treatment is needed, no stitching up thereafter. So there's just no need for surgery at all in these patients. So the study that we're talking about this evening was a continuation of an initial US-based study at 11 sites um, for general Delfonta use, which had got several controls within, but perhaps not um, all controls that you might um, ideally um, want in a paper or in a study. Um, the dogs in the first study didn't, um, there were cases in the controls, the cases got treatment, the controls didn't get the Delfonta treatment. Um, and any patient in the cases who didn't respond well to the first injection were offered a second injection roughly a month later. Um, and those patients who required a second injection to get into remission were not included in the current study, um, which could indicate that um, you know, some of the more difficult to treat tumours were um, kind of shifted out of the study. Um, but also you could argue that if they didn't get into remission, especially if they didn't form a wound um, after the first injection, then maybe it was a technical issue with the stuff onto treatment rather than resistance from the tumour. Um, in the original study, um, cases um, that were actually controls in the first arm of the study were then allowed to have um, actual stuff onto treatment a month later. Um, and this study is based on all of those dogs, whether they were originally cases or originally controls, all of those dogs that had complete remission after 28 days after one injection of stuff onto and then they were included in the current study. Pretty much all of the dogs had physiological grading as per an article by Scarpa et al in 2016, um, but there was very little staging, which is, you could argue, one of the advantages um, of Stafonta, but also one of the limitations, as we'll go on to discuss. The patients were then assessed uh, for a limited range of data at six months and 12 months after the original injection. And these assessments mainly happened at their local vets with a clinical visit and or a phone call from uh, researchers to the owners um, if there was no clinical visit sometimes. Um, and if neither of these were available, if no data could be collected, then the patients were said to be lost to follow up. Um, one restriction is that this study seemed to be a kind of a continuation of a previous study without that being planned at the first study. Um, and so the calls and the visits were not scheduled. The owners kind of didn't know that they were due to happen. Um, and so uh, in a way we had to be lucky that the owners responded or that the owners were around six or 12 months later. There was no um, compulsion of them to attend those uh, clinics six and 12 months later based on the first study. So um, 21 of the 85 enrolled dogs failed to reach the 12 month stage um, with data being collected. Uh, we know that five of those died uh, because of non mast cell tumour related causes, including one who died from a metastatic mast cell tumour uh, that's in the table. But that dog, the mast cell tumour that caused death with metastasis, were on the opposite side of the body to the mast cell tumour that was treated with Stafonta. Um, and so that's probably safe to say it uh, wasn't a direct cause. Um, the, the original mass cell tumour that was treated with stuff onto it probably wasn't a direct cause of um, death. Another had an unknown cause of death, which I suppose possibly could be mass cell tumour related. 
um, looking at the ones that were lost. So 16 cases were just lost to follow up. Um, uh, they didn't attend those six and 12 month um, recheck appointments um, or phone calls. Um, and I suppose you could argue that some of those may have been um, mass tumour related deaths, but we'll just never know. Of the cases that remained, uh, that, that remained in contact with the study and alive, 89% um, of those 60 odd cases were accessible. Um, and seven recurrences had happened, which represents 11% of these cases by 12 months. All recurrences happened at less than six months um, after injection, um, and most of these happened within three months after injection. Looking to see if there was anything that could indicate why these were recurring, um, of the seven cases that recurred um, or had a recurrent tumour, one was cytologically high grade and one was likely or suspected to be cytologically high grade. So perhaps that's a risk factor for patients um, having recurrence, and we know that that's true in other studies. Um, and they said that no, so few recurrences happened that no statistical testing was tried. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm reading this too harshly, but I probably would prefer that statistical testing was. Um, performed and that the conclusions were non-significant with wide confidence intervals rather than the testing wasn't even tried but um, that's what's reported in the paper. In terms of the discussion they mentioned that there's controversy around uh, margins um, of incision for mast cell tumours and while I would agree with us in general terms um, I think we also have a good kind of working consensus on that which is that if you have the opportunity to go wide maybe two or three centimetres with one uninvolved fascial plane deeply then that's what we do in areas such as the lower limb or where the anatomy is complex and we don't we tend to remove as much as we can and then analyse the results of surgery and go from there um, so I would agree to an extent that there's no consensus absolutely but we have a good way of working around these cases already I would say I've not talked to a pathologist about the next statement, but they say that there's an arbitrary decision by pathologists as to which mast cells, especially at the periphery of um, a, a section, um, are neoplastic um, and which are not. And um, yes, I would agree that that is the case, um, but there are certain telltale signs such as bizarre morphology, clustering and mitotic activity that strongly suggest that a mast cell tumour or a mast cell, should I say, um, is neoplastic rather than not being neoplastic uh, near the edge of the lesion. Admissibly, there are probably some neoplastic mast cells that don't exhibit these features that go on to be neoplastic and go on to be a threat to the patient. Um, but to say that it's an arbitrary decision, I'm not sure if that kind of um, uh, doesn't suggest there's so much skill on the, path of, uh, on the part of the pathologist, which I would slightly disagree with. There is um, quite a bit of discussion about how the measurement of margin and the prognosis might be linked or there might be differences uh, between what you would expect based on margins and prognosis. Um, call into question how valid that is or how um, uh, robust that is and I would agree with that. But what's not really addressed for me is that um, the measurement of margin often plays into a decision regarding prompt subsequent therapy. Um, and so that's something that I don't think is addressed fully in the paper. And for me, while the paper does present some of the kind of poorer studies with regard to margin status and what the margin status leads to, um, uh, I would say that there's you know, quite a bit of information that's much more robust with regard to margins, which I'll present on the next uh, slide. So, for example, um, studies have shown that the risk of recurrence after incomplete resection of a grade 2 dermal mass cell tumour can be as low as 23%, so 77% non-recurrence. Um, and then that recurrence risk is reduced to 12% if the patient also has a low mitotic grade 2 mast cell tumour. Whereas if we look at subcutaneous mast cell tumours, they have a recurrence risk in general of about 12% when incompletely resected. And so this is similar to what can be achieved with stuff on, so you could argue based on the results in this paper. Um, on a more positive note, the, the uh, authors do recognise that they had very few high-grade mast cell tumours um, in part, but not necessarily saying that that could lead to a more favourable uh, prognosis compared to other papers that had a higher proportion of high-grade mast cell tumours within. So in the, towards the end of the discussion, they suggest that the use of thermography um, could be a, sur a surrogate for tumour-free margin assessment, but this, um, as they acknowledge, has not been pathologically ver validated. Um, and I would say it's unlikely to give us information down to the cellular level that histopathology does provide. The data presented in the paper absolutely supports that the treatment generally gives prolonged um, local control in most cases, and even if you're sceptical about how many of the um, lost to follow-up cases might have had mass or tumour recurrence, it's still the vast majority of patients um, having durable control based on their data.
they mentioned that um, having a post-therapy biopsy would be difficult from a kind of an ethical point of view and a, a pain-causing point of view, which I, I would agree with. Um, but I understand that this has been pursued by some clients who were kind of worried about wound healing and stuff. Um, and to date, um, I haven't seen the data, data of those biopsies being published. Um, I'd also agree that, as they say, the role of mast cells in healing might lead to confusion as to um, you know, what the nature of any mast cells in those biopsies might be. But it would be really nice to see if there were clusters or bizarre morphology or mitotically active mast cells that would strongly suggest residual, potentially viable um, neoplastic mast cells in those biopsies. It would be really nice to see that data if they could present that. So the, in terms of my overall feeling for the paper and my overall critique of the paper, um, I would suggest that the data presented uh, give us very little doubt, in fact no doubt at all, that it works really, really well. Um, and because of the data that I've shown just recently, I would say it's probably comparable to incomplete surgery on um, perhaps not very aggressive uh, mass of tumours, but including those in very difficult to operate areas. Um, you could argue that you know, nobody intentionally wants to go for incomplete surgery and that complete surgery, complete removal is always um, the aim. Um, but you know, in difficult to operate areas, this is a very, very good option. I think it's going to be uh, very popular with many clients, especially those clients whose dogs have multiple mass cell tumors over the course of their lifetime and who perhaps lose um, patients with surgery or are looking for something that is kind of less costly than surgery over time. But um, in my head, going back to the comparison with surgery, um, if you were to operate on similar patients um, after surgery, the need for additional treatment afterwards, such as prompt repeat surgery, um, if the margin was poor, or radiation therapy, if the margin was poor, or perhaps chemotherapy, if it was high grade or showed evidence of um, a metastasis already, that would be based on histopathological assessments taken at the time of surgery. Um, and one of the disadvantages of the convenience of um, Stelfonta is that we don't have those um, uh, details. And so one question that um, I think remains is, how do we know which Stelfonta patients need similar adjuvant therapy um, after their Stelfonta treatment? Um, that's kind of, I think, a, a kind of a dilemma uh, with the use of Stelfonta, I would say. I also have a slight um, hesitation about um, uh, the impact of wounds over two to three weeks while the patient heals, um, especially in summer. But then again, in most of the studies or most of the uh, data that the manufacturers have is based on treatment of patients in Australia, and there doesn't seem to be a problem with flies or you know, other problem complications in hot weather with wounds. And further to my general thoughts on this paper, I thought I would just put in a slide of full disclosure. So I personally haven't used this drug. I've had two patients or two clients um, that have been very, very close to using this, but um, psychological staging reveals metastasis in both. And so I haven't actually had any personal use myself. Um, I would admit to some inertia in moving on from an established treatment, even if it doesn't have a consensus to a new treatment, um, you know, when it's brand new. Um, so I think that's a little bit of a struggle for me, but I think well supported by the, um, the evidence that I've presented. I also recognise that as a medical oncologist, I'm very spoiled in my uh, current positions where I don't do my own surgery and I have access, direct access to surgeons who have lots and lots of reconstructive surgery experience, who are expert surgeons, and also direct access to radiation therapy for uh, margins that are incomplete um, as adjuvant therapy. But then again, all of us have access to those by referrals, so you know, these remain good options for patients who have difficult to treat mast cell tumours. And uh, as I mentioned on the last slide, um, I think it's going to be a great option um, for patients to treat sometimes difficult local disease in the distal limb, but sadly the convenience of it does not allow us to verify how adequate that local treatment has been, um, nor to stage the patient unless we do additional testing. Um, and therefore, it doesn't allow us to have prompt intervention when perhaps that prompt intervention is necessary. Just as an expansion on that, we know that cytological um, uh, staging of lymph nodes for mass cell tumor patients uh, leads us to miss maybe about a third of cases that have metastasis. Um, and so very, very commonly, I'm recommending extirpation of at least one, if not multiple local lymph nodes when a mass cell tumor is removed to give us the most accurate staging information. And sadly, that's not available with stuff on to when um, adopting a non-surgical approach, unless the owner wants to have stuff on to treatment for the mass and then surgical extirpation or surgical base staging um, for um, the uh, lymph nodes.
But in conclusion, I do think it's going to be a great treatment um, for local therapy. Um, obviously, the main threat to survival is from metastatic cases. And there is probably only a very tiny number of patients who develop a recurrent mass of tumour and then were non-metastatic at the start of treatment. Um, and then as the mass of tumour recurs in that interim period, they then go on to develop metastasis, which is potentially life-threatening. Um, and so there's only a very small risk of uh, a very um, inferior outcome from using a treatment that gives us um, local control for a period and then a few patients have a recurrence later on. Um, I think that is very much the nightmare scenario. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's one of the kind of things to think about with regard to the use of local treatments that um, don't um, have instant validation of how successful they've been. And then um, we have to um, wait for the recurrence to show the patients that might need follow-up therapy. So just in case there's any technical difficulties, we're going to hold um, discussion or questions or comments or anything like that until after the second paper is discussed. Um, yeah, so we'll do that in a few slides time. And so we're going to discuss the second paper, which is on sentinel lymph node detection differs when compared lymphocytic free to lymphography using a water-soluble iodinated contrast medium um, and digital radiography in dogs by Hulsko et al. in 2020. In the background section, they mention um, that sensitive lymph node mapping is becoming more common, maybe even approaching a standard in veterinary medicine as well as in human medicine. And there have been various methods of doing this, including radiation-based fluorescent dyes, ultrasonographic, infrared, radiographic, lots and lots of options. Um, some of the most handy ones um, offer intraoperative information, so if there's not a different procedure on a, a preoperative day, that all happens at one. Um, but especially those ones um, often need uh, new equipment, um, and uh, especially for radiation-based options, uh, would influence um, patients uh, and staff exposure and handling both pre- and post-operatively. So um, lots of kind of impact on how we normally do things. More available than these um, options is water-soluble iodine contrast material, um, and most of the studies on such an approach, or um, the basis of an approach, have been based on CT to date. Um, there was, um, the uh, authors make reference to a study by Warland et al. Um, suggesting that there's no need to stage uh, beyond the lymph node, such as in the viscera, um, from mass cell tumours. Um, but I would argue that there's more recent data to suggest that occasionally we do have skip metastasis um, or that the, what we think is the draining lymph node is missed um, by metastatic mast cells and actually we have regional metastasis or visceral metastasis without the uh, what we think is the most obvious draining lymph node being affected. So um, although I think um, a sentinel lymph node approach is very useful, um, I don't think it necessarily um, means that we don't have to stage more widely, including in, in canine dermal mast cell tumours. The aim of the study was to compare lymphocytography using technetium to lymphoradiography using um, water soluble iodine contrast material and uh, digital radiography for sentinel lymph node detection. And the presumption was that there would be agreement between um, the two different types of lymph node um, sentinel lymph node detection. So um, the patients involved in the study, this terribly sexist study, and um, that involved eight intact all male beagles under two years of age who were uh, deemed to be ostensibly healthy. Um, obviously, I'm not a fan of experimental animals, um, but these uh, patients were assessed for their health and monitored for their welfare throughout the study. Um, but again, not really a huge fan. Um, and they had a mid-lateral uh, area of the brachial skin um, identified about 1.5 by 2 centimeters across, um, and this is divided into four quadrants. Um, initially, the patients were randomly assigned left or right, but later, to make sure that we had four left and four right, they were um, equalized thereafter, and injections were performed by a trained resident or diplomats um, with experience in sentinel lymph node detection um, in the four quadrants, um, as described on the next slide. For stentigraphy, um, they had sedation and they were monitored adequately during that sedation uh, based on the data presented. And a technetium coated sulfur colloid with 4.6 or so megabecquerels um, of activity in 0.5 mils of uh, volume was injected into each quadrant with lateral images taken by stentigraphy at 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30 minutes after injection. There were some orthogonal views taken, uh, but mainly lateral views and the procedure was said to have failed if there was no lymph node enhancement within 30 minutes. For the radiographic assessment, 
Um, this was performed four days after scintigraphy and was similarly achieved, but with the double the volume of water-soluble iodinated contrast material with images acquired by digital radiography at 0, 1, 2, 5 and 10 minutes later, again with some orthogonal views and failure of the lymph node enhancement um, if there was no lymph node enhancement at 10 minutes. The data um, acquired was assessed by diplomat radiologists um, in uh, four for um, scintigraphy, uh, sorry, eight for scintigraphy and eight for radiography by different diplomats, um, and was assessed with regard to the location of the lymph node, the time at which the lymph node was initially identified, and the time of maximum enhancement of the lymph node. In terms of results, all patients had um, a positive identification of a sentinel lymph node by scintigraphy, um, and seven of the eight patients had identification of a sentinel lymph node by radiographic evaluation, and the patient who failed to have um, a radiographic identified enhanced lymph node was the patient for which identification by scintigraphic methods was slowest, so perhaps um, a kind of a compromise in that individual patient. The main outcome of the study was whether the axillary or the superficial cervical, formerly um, prescapular lymph node, was going to be identified as the sentinel lymph node. And it turned out to be the superficial cervical in two patients by scintigraphy, but none by radiography. The axillary in three scintigraphic patients, but uh, five radiographically assessed patients. Both of the lymph nodes um, by scintigraphy in three patients and two patients uh, in radiography. And none of the lymph nodes um, were only identified in that one patient who failed to give us a result in radiography. So a little bit more about the results um, where the results fully matched each other in three cases, partially in four cases, and did not match each other um, in terms of scintigraphy versus radiography in that one case which failed to have um, any uh, lymph node enhancement by radiography. By partial agreement, it was meant that uh, two lymph nodes were detected as sentinels in one method, um, scintigraphy or radiography, um, and then in the same patient, um, only one lymph node was found as sentinel using the um, opposite technique. They go on to discuss how uh, scintigraphy took up to 30 minutes, but radiography was limited to 10 minutes based on the speed of uptake of the material, uh, of the contrast material, but also expressed um, some regret uh, because despite their extensive experience in this field, perhaps that one case that failed to have a sentinel lymph node identified by radiography just needed a bit more time, perhaps for lymph flow to enhance the lymph node. They also detailed that the bloom um, of um, radioactivity around the injected area of um, material um, with the scintigraphic method sometimes um, obfuscated or obscured the axillary lymph node area. And so this might have uh, resulted in some underestimation of the frequency of axillary lymph node involvement, um, which led to the near doubling um, of the axillary lymph node being detected as sentinel using the radiographic technique over the scintigraphic technique. In the um, conclusions uh, section, I realise that this is primarily an imaging paper um, and they focus on kind of imaging matters, uh, but they say that the lack of full agreement between the studies shows that mapping perhaps should be done by multiple methods. However, as I'll go on to argue uh, on the next slide, um, we all realise that these um, methods have their limitations in terms of sensitivity, um, and so it may be good if we're operating and it doesn't increase morbidity in the patient just to operate regionally with regard to lymph node removal and uh, perhaps that would avoid some faffing around. Um, uh, but just to underline, I think this is a really good paper and really good techniques. Um, it's just that some patients, uh, some clients really don't have the money for that and um, need to uh, kind of just concentrate their funds on the surgery rather than anything else. The data suggests that the radiographic technique is effective and is definitely more convenient with more readily available uh, equipment and consumables and will no doubt be cheaper and easier to implement um, in day-to-day -day practice, however. So um, that was a really good point from the paper. One criticism that I had is um, I wondered um, if there was any variation in where the contrast material reached uh, by injection day to day with a kind of a variation in where the um, extent of um, uh, kind of um, uh, contrast material uh, position was. Um, and so I wondered if they could have been run concurrently, maybe um, if there was enough metallic uh, technician in the injection for scintigraphy to be shown up radiographically or whether the materials could have been mixed so that we just had two studies based on one injection for uh, maybe perhaps more robust data. And the authors do consi consider whether the superficial cervical or the axillary may be um, efferent or afferent to each other. 
which I've um, not read about before. Um, I've always um, kind of read about them being quite independent, um, but they don't extend that point into, say, the hind limb, where you might consider the popliteal and the inguinal and um, some of the more internal lymph nodes as being kind of in a series um, with each other and actually kind of uh, maybe adopting a more regional approach when it comes to both assessment of lymph node involvement and perhaps surgical removal of lymph nodes. And perhaps uh, elaborating on that point, um, when, the, when the authors say that it might be good to have um, several different lymph node assessments, I would probably suggest that one of those should be histopathology, um, which is probably going to be um, viewed as the gold standard. Um, and so um, yeah, it would be lovely to have histopathology val validation of um, these findings. Uh, this study reports that previous assessments um, of lymph node um, uh, scintigraphy, sorry, lymph node sentinel present um, have shown complete agreement, but not all have shown uh, complete agreement, so I don't think that's a major limitation to the current study. And um, in the current study, there seems to be a bit of a semantic um, discussion about the sentinel or first lymph node identified, um, whereas obviously, um, you know, from a, a disease point of view, we want to be comprehensive, and so it's perhaps more um, informative to say which uh, lymph nodes have been involved at all, rather than just which is the quickest and most obvious one. Uh, because obviously the tumour has had more time for metastasis to develop between lymph nodes. The authors do relate this to uh, disease such as with uh, tumour lymphangiogenesis um, and maybe alteration of the expected sensitive lymph node, uh, but they don't consider other things like blocked lymphatics such as with a tumour effaced lymph node, so perhaps initial drainage through that lymph node, through that functional lymph node, um, would have given one result, but then if it becomes fully effaced and the drainage is diverted to a different lymph node, perhaps that would give a different result at the time of assessment. So again, kind of um, putting my cards on the table, I probably would be relatively hard to convince that, uh, based on several uh, papers, um, that a regionally based approach to lymph node removal um, is not appropriate. So we have lots of information on multiple lymph nodes being metastatic um, from a single mast cell tumour. We also have known that for a long time, say with the oral melanomas, um, where it's very commonplace uh, with one um, oral melanoma being removed, to have both the retropharyngeals and bilaterally and the mandibular lymph nodes bilaterally being removed uh, for comprehensiveness. Um, and similar studies exist for canine mammary tumours. But I would argue that that's very different when we're just removing the major lymph nodes to the kind of deep, extensive dissection that used to happen um, for breast cancer patients and people that led to complications such as lymphedema. So um, removal of a couple of uh, regional lymph nodes to, for comprehensiveness, I think, is uh, very well supported and leads to very few complications. So that concludes uh, my assessment of the second paper. And uh, just in case there's an IT failure and we don't get to speak in person about questions and comments about the papers, I'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening, but hopefully we'll speak in person in just a second. Thank you very much.